The International Space Station is set to retire soon, and when that happens, China's Tiangong Space Station could become the only operational station in orbit. Obviously, the US doesn't want that to happen. They're looking at commercial options, not just to replace the ISS, but to build something even more advanced and capable than anything that's come before. And the one I'm about to talk about today might just be it. Last week, privately held American aerospace company Vast announced that it had completed the final weld on the primary structure of its Haven 1 space station. If you look at the video of this single module and think it looks pretty humble compared to the entire ISS, well, you wouldn't be alone. But if there's something we've learned from China's Tiangong station, it's that size isn't everything. A smaller station can be just as capable, or even more so, than a larger one. And that's exactly what Haven 1 is aiming for. VAST's approach is fast, focused, and unapologetically pragmatic. Instead of building a sprawling orbital lab, they've designed a tightly scoped system that does just enough, safely and efficiently. With an interior volume of 45 cubic meters, about 1,590 cubic feet, Haven 1 is roughly the size of a small tour bus. Its life support system draws inspiration from earlier NASA designs, using a simpler open-loop setup similar to what the space shuttle relied on. Visually, it's a departure from the industrial, pipe-laden look of the ISS. Haven 1 leans into a cleaner, more futuristic aesthetic. Less space garage, more space hotel. But the sleek design isn't just for show. It's about function. We go to space to work, says Vast CEO Max Hout. And it's easy to understand that if you can rest better, feel better, and communicate better, you're going to work better. To that end, VAST has put serious thought into crew comfort. Their Human Factors team, led by veteran NASA astronaut Drew Feustel, who spent over 200 days in space, is rethinking the basics. Take sleeping, for example. Instead of floating loosely or wedging into a corner like on the ISS, Astronauts on Haven 1 will use inflatable beds that apply gentle pressure, mimicking a sensation many miss in microgravity. And Haven 1 will be the first space station equipped with SpaceX's Starlink, delivering gigabit speed internet in orbit. That's a game changer for communication, research, and outreach. Propulsion comes from impulse space, using a storable nitrous oxide and ethane combo. The system includes tanks, fluid lines, control electronics, and scythe thrusters for fine-tuned maneuvering. There's even a dome on board, ideal for Earth observation, photography, or just taking in the view. VAST is also thinking beyond just habitation. In August 2024, they announced the addition of the Haven 1 Lab, a dedicated microgravity R&D facility. It'll host up to 10 payloads, each supporting up to 30 kilograms and drawing 100 watts of power. The first announced partners include Redwire and Yuri Gravity. Keeping things simple has allowed VAST to move quickly. The structure was completed in July and is already being prepped for testing. By early next year, the entire system should be integrated and undergoing final checks ahead of launch. Haven 1 won't be the biggest or most complex station in orbit, but it will be the first to be fully built, funded, and operated by a private company. And that's the point. By proving that orbital infrastructure can be lean, elegant, and commercially viable, VAST hopes to redefine what's possible in low Earth orbit. Whether for science, exploration, or industry, Hayat believes the future of space won't belong to nations. It'll belong to whoever gets there first. The station is currently scheduled to launch no earlier than May 2026 atop a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. The first mission to Haven 1, called VAST-1, will send a crew of four astronauts aboard a Crew Dragon spacecraft for a 30-day stay on the station. Additional missions using Crew Dragon are expected to follow ferrying astronauts to and from Haven 1 throughout its operational lifespan. Now, if you're still thinking Haven 1 is too small to replace the ISS, don't worry. There's a reason it's called Haven 1. 
This initial station is designed as a self-contained module and serves as a proof of concept ahead of something much bigger, the multi-module Haven 2. The first Haven 2 module will be 5 meters longer than Haven 1 and will nearly double its livable volume, all while using the same proven systems. Once that first Haven 2 module is in orbit, VAST plans to follow up with three more modules over a two-year period. Each will follow the same efficient, cost-effective design, adding more usable volume, better facilities, and critical systems like expanded life support and consumables. With each new Haven 2 module, VAST will also roll out more advanced life support technologies. These modules will offer expanded payload capacity while sticking to the same core design and hardware lineage. At the heart of Haven 2 is the Haven 2 Lab, a state-of-the-art research facility built to support a wide range of microgravity experiments and in-space manufacturing. Compared to Haven 1, this lab brings significantly more volume and power, allowing for larger payloads, more complex lab setups, and greater operational flexibility. It also ensures stable power and thermal control for demanding research and commercial projects. Importantly, the Haven 2 lab meets all of NASA's basic laboratory capabilities requirements under the CLD program, meaning it's fully aligned with top-tier standards for orbital research readiness. To encourage global collaboration, VAST also plans to offer international partners the ability to dedicate an entire module or a portion of the Haven 2 lab for their own research, opening the door for wider participation in space science and microgravity R&D. Starting in 2028, VAST aims to launch a new module roughly every six months, gradually assembling a full commercial station by around 2032. While Haven 2 will be smaller than the ISS in overall size, its final configuration will actually offer a larger habitable volume, with capacity for up to 12 crew members. And, if it all goes to plan, VAST will be the first company to build, launch, and operate a fully private commercial space station, a major first in spaceflight history. But it doesn't stop there. Haven 2 is just the beginning. This project is VAST's first step toward its long-term goal, building a 100-meter-long, multi-module, spinning artificial gravity space station. And just to be clear, yes, that would make it the first and only station, public or private, to offer artificial gravity in orbit, ever. It's great that we now have several promising options to replace the ISS as it nears retirement. But over at NASA, there's growing concern that progress just isn't fast enough. NASA is changing its strategy for helping private companies build new space stations. And some people are worried this shift could mean the end of a continuous human presence in low Earth orbit after the ISS retires in 2030. Originally, NASA's Commercial Low Earth Orbit Destinations CLD program was designed to fund and certify commercial stations that could support long-duration human missions. The idea was to follow the ISS model, requiring these new stations to host four-person crews, including two NASA astronauts, for at least six months at a time. However, Due to funding constraints, with a shortfall of up to $4 billion, and growing concerns about a potential gap in U.S. human spaceflight, NASA has revised Phase 2 of the program. The agency is now opting for a more flexible and cost-effective approach, using Space Act agreements instead of traditional fixed-price contracts. Basically, because of budget issues and delays, NASA has decided that the original plan just isn't realistic right now. So instead, they're going with a scaled-down approach that focuses on getting something up there quickly, even if it's just for short missions. So, what exactly is changing? First, NASA is moving away from fixed-price contracts. These are the standard deals where companies are paid a set amount to deliver specific results. 
Instead, the agency will use Space Act agreements, which are more flexible and allow companies to take different paths to reach the same goals. The idea is to move faster, spend less, and lower the risk of delays. Under the new plan, NASA will fund at least two companies with a combined budget of up to $1.5 billion, spread over several years. These companies will build and test smaller, simpler space stations that can support a four-person crew for just 30 days. That's a big step down from the original six-month goal, but it's seen as a smart compromise to keep momentum going. NASA's long-term goal is still to support longer-duration missions and more capable stations. But for now, they're okay with shorter trips, and even short-term gaps with no astronauts in orbit, as long as the U.S. still has the ability to send humans to space when needed. That's a major shift from the permanent presence mindset that's defined the ISS era. Big players like Axiom Space, Blue Origin, and Star Lab are already working with NASA under earlier agreements. They've been designing their stations with the old plan in mind, so now they'll have to adjust. Instead of aiming straight for long-duration missions, these companies may now focus on shorter trips to prove their systems work. NASA is aiming for the first demo missions by 2030, likely without NASA astronauts on board, just private crews testing the basics. So what about VAST? What does this mean for them and their Haven space station? Well, Max Hayot doesn't see this shift as a setback at all. In fact, he says NASA's new strategy is the smartest move they could make right now. His company, VAST, is building Haven 1, which is already designed for 30 to 40 day missions with four person crews. So this new direction from NASA lines up perfectly with their plan. Hayot thinks starting with shorter missions just makes sense. Trying to jump straight to permanent human presence, he says, would only create delays and risk missing the window to have anything ready by the time the ISS retires. He also agrees with NASA's decision to fund more than one company. He points out how having both SpaceX and Boeing in the commercial crew program created healthy competition and made the overall system more reliable. He believes the same approach should apply to commercial space stations. NASA shouldn't rely on just one provider. Companies like VAST aren't just depending on NASA for income. Hayot says only 20 to 30 percent of their expected revenue will come from NASA. The rest will come from international partners and private clients interested in doing research or exploration in space. Space tourism isn't their main focus. VAST is targeting real science and commercial use. Hitu also points out that if a company can survive and be profitable in today's space economy, they'll be well-positioned when new opportunities, like in-space manufacturing or media partnerships, emerge down the line. Back at NASA, officials say the new approach is about being realistic. They know they don't have unlimited funding and don't want to repeat past mistakes. They'd rather start with something small and functional than aim too high and risk ending up with nothing at all. Angela Hart, who leads the CLD program at NASA, says this is all about helping companies prove they can actually build safe, working stations that NASA can rely on in the future. The 30-day mission is just step one. And some outside experts agree. Phil McAllister, a former NASA official who helped shape the commercial spaceflight program, called the new plan genius. He said the earlier expectations were just too ambitious for the available budget. If NASA had stuck to them, the U.S. might have ended up with no space presence after the ISS shuts down. Meanwhile, China is continuing to operate its Tiangong space station, which is permanently crewed. So, yes, there's still a space race happening, even if it's a quieter one.